Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message. Here's our hope that as you hear the word of God preached, that you would see Jesus more clearly and love him more deeply. And so over the next few moments, take notes, focus, and hear how the word of God is going to transform you. Uh, I want to take a minute before we jump into the word to just celebrate something. Uh, and so... Uh, since I have been here, I, in fact, I can think the first time I was an elder meet, in an elder meeting, one of the things that we talked about is uh, membership. How are we going to do membership? How quickly are we going to get to membership? And I know as I say that, you might be like, I, I don't really care that much. Uh, but let me tell you why it's important. Uh, I, I read an author one time that said that nobody cares about the plumbing in their house until it goes bad. Yeah. Like nobody's like, man, do we have copper pipes or do we have PVC pipes? Until you realize that your copper pipes are 73 years old and they don't work. Maybe that might be personal. But when you, when you recognize that something might be just structure, sometimes it doesn't seem like it has the sizzle or the appeal. But when you find out that that thing is vital to the way that you operate together, then all of a sudden it means a little bit more. And when you talk about covenant partnership, or that's the way that we describe membership, it, it's this something that is maybe not easily seen, but it's actually what holds us together and belonging and unity. Even the words that we use are important. So this idea of covenant, it's the idea of the deepest relationships that the, the scriptures describe. It's not just like, okay, you know what? I'm going to check you out for a little bit while. It's, it's not a dating relationship. It's not like, you know what? You chew too loudly with your mouth open. I'm out. It's covenant. It's even when you're not faithful, I'll be faithful. It's 100, 100. I'm giving you all of me and we're gonna give you all of us. Like that's what covenant calls you to. And then partnership is more than just a name on a roster. Partnership is that there's a part that you play specifically that we aren't what we can, what we're supposed to be if you aren't playing that role. And so when we celebrate covenant partnership, we're celebrating this level of unity and this level of belonging that the world knows nothing about. You might be a member at Costco, but they're going to be all right if you stop coming, especially if you're still a member and you stop coming because that's free money. But to be in a partnership with somebody means that, that, that I am in and I play a role and it's important. And so as, when I arrived, we were trying to develop that and get there. And so it's a major milestone when we get to celebrate. And so uh, we get to celebrate people from our first and second class that have gone through. Uh, there are others that are still in process, but I just want to take a moment and read those names to you. Um, some of these names are people who are uh, at Church on the Beach, serving at Church on the Beach, and so they may not be here to stand. But if you are here and I read your name, I'd love for you to stand and we would love to pray for you. And so uh, Chris Allen. James Beardsley. James is actually serving at this moment, uh, running one of our cameras. Uh, Doug Borstel. Adria Brown. Greg and Linda Caruso. Caroline Crawford. Denise and Rodney Fiedler. Sergio Lovato. Katie McGrew. Bernard and Mitz Novia. Greg and Rhonda Owens. Chris and Lily Taban and Regina and Steve Whiteman. If you're here and your name was read, we'd love for you to stand. We'd love to celebrate you taking that step of commitment, <laughs> that, that step of celebration, community, and, long, and belonging. Now, I recognize that in church, it's always a scary thing if a pastor's like, hey, raise your hand or stand because that means he's gonna make you do something. I'm not gonna make you do anything, but we do wanna pray for you. And so if you are around one of these people and you want to stretch your arm that direction or maybe even put a hand on a shoulder, I want to give you the freedom to do that. But I just want to take a few moments and pray for them uh, and just to thank the Lord for the, the step of commitment that they've taken. So I'll give you just a few seconds if you want to gather around. And so, Jesus, we thank you. Um, because of the blood of your cross, those who are far off and those who are near are made to be one. In fact, Ephesians would say that we become uh, one new humanity together. But in the midst of that, Lord, you've decided that you're going to have these smaller collections of people that would call each other brothers and sisters and, and know each other more intimately than just uh, understanding that one day in glory we'll sing of your praise forever. And so, Lord, this moment is one of those clear pictures of belonging, one of those clear pictures of unity, one of those clear pictures of commitment. And so, Lord, I am thankful for these men and women who said, I I'm in. 
Uh, one of the things that we've talked about uh, this year is that we're, we're, we're walking in a way that we want to be all in together. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's moving at the same pace, but what it does mean is that, Lord, you have set something before us and we are walking together towards that thing and we're being faithful in whatever role you've called us into. And so, Lord, thank you for uh, these people who are saying uh, that I want the depth of relationship and I want the, the responsibility of partnership and they've stepped forward and leaned into that. And so, Lord, I pray that you would protect them. I know that the enemy, uh, while it's celebration weekend for us, it's certainly not that for the enemy of our souls. That there, he that he is not excited about children being dedicated or people being baptized, and he's certainly not excited about us breaking the cultural current of low commitment or no commitment at all to lean in and say we're in this together for the glory of God's name. And so, Lord, would you use the the gifts? the passions, the, uh, the ways that you've wired uh, these men and women that we would be covenanting together for, for the purposes of your gospel. Um, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for more that is to come. It's in your name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Congratulations, you guys. If you want to take that step, uh, our next covenant partnership class will be on May 1st. And so you can mark your calendars for that. Those of you who are super planners and thinking, uh, what do I got on the first? Uh, I'm proud of you that you know, um, but you can put that on your calendars. Uh, if you got a Bible, go with me to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, we're going to be in verse 22 of that chapter. Uh, as you get there, uh, um, this text is really intentional. On May 8th of 2020, I... It had been a whirlwind week up to that point anyways. Um, various things had happened, but one of those that, that sticks out to me uh, is there's a, there was an organization called One Day LA that was working on a project for July of 2020 to, to just kind of ransack the, the greater LA area with the love of Jesus. And somehow my name ended up on their call list and they invited me to come out. And so uh, they were having a, a worship service and a meal for pastors. And so uh, myself and a, another young man from our church, we, we got in the car, drove to downtown LA. We we're at the convention center. Uh, and I, I'm sitting in this room and the keynote speaker was uh, supposed to be Craig Groeschel, who's the pastor of Life Church in Oklahoma City. I say Life Church in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, Kansas, Missouri, uh, maybe some of the moons on Mars. Like, like, he, like they just have campuses everywhere. And... Instead of him walking in the room, he comes up in a, on a screen. And he says, hey, I was just in Germany at a fundraiser, and I was sitting next to somebody who has coronavirus. So therefore, I'm not going to be able to be here. He's like, so I'm locked in a room away from my family. He's like, I've got my computer. I've got my iPad. And then he had, like, weights in the corner. Like, I'm like, man, you are just better than me. Like, if I had a virus, like, I'm probably not working out. Like, maybe I would have Twinkies in the corner, but not weights. And so... At that moment, it was kind of one of those, okay, this feels a little bit more real. That, that same day, I, I'm, I'm sitting in the kitchen, and, and Sky comes walking in, and she said, hey, I know we got celebration this weekend, celebration Sunday this weekend, and we're going to be feeding people. Should we, should we think about this? Should we, like, do something? Um, which usually in my life, when the Lord's doing something, Sky is always, like, 10 steps ahead of me. So I'm like, okay, maybe the Lord's in this. And so I can remember walking in that weekend and reading through this text to, to kind of still our hearts in prayer. And now, two years later, to the weekend, two years later on a celebration weekend to be in the room with you to testify to the goodness of the Lord, um, I don't think there's actually any text that's better than this one. And so here's our, here's our main idea. The story of Peter climbing out of the boat reminds us of the courage needed to follow Jesus. When Jesus calls, will you follow him? So what we'll do is uh, in verses 22 through 31, we're just gonna see this picture of troubled waters. And then in verses 31 and 32, uh, we're gonna see this picture of worship and doubt. And so let me pray one more time and then we'll jump into the word together. Jesus, thank you. Um, my heart's already overwhelmed. Um, I'm not a hype guy, but I also don't wanna miss the moment that you are doing something significant amongst your people right now in a way that hasn't happened before and that may not ever happen again. And so, Lord, I just, even in this prayer, there's this level of stillness and smallness that I feel. Help me not get in the way. Help me not get in the way of what you want to do in the hearts of those whom you love, that you're drawing to trust you more deeply. Lord, it's in your matchless name I pray. 
Amen. Amen. Matthew 22, uh, or 14, starting in verse 22, would say this. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there all alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, between, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind and he, he was afraid, and, began to sink, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, as we uh, read that, I'll just confess to you. I'm the type of person who's often read this narrative and laughed at Peter. Like, I, like Peter has, gives us plenty of times to say, Oh, man, I can't believe you did that. Um, and, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, that oftentimes when you read the narratives of Scripture, you need to remember that it's not just a window into how God was working in a particular moment, but it's also a mirror of how you might be living as well. And so the truth is, I'm more like Peter than I want to admit. Um, I, I have a, a very similar situation as Peter that isn't anything to do with trusting the Lord and walking on water. It was making an announcements video about baptism. Some guys threw me in a deep end of a pool not knowing I couldn't swim. But they, they came and got me, so I made it out. But the reality was, like, I can get that moment of terror and fear when you feel overwhelmed by something that's around you. And what's, what's interesting about this story is where it's placed in the book of Matthew. If you start reading uh, this chapter, it starts with the death of John the Baptist. That is not a moment that is a, a high mark moment for this burgeoning Christian movement uh, of small believers who are, who are similar to what's been around them, but are, are, are trusting something a little bit different and following after the way of Jesus more than following after the, the historic tradition. And then right after that, they had gone away to kind of rest and recoup, to, to get into some isolation where they could be with the Lord and be with one another. And then all of a sudden, a crowd of people come running to get near to what Jesus is doing, so much so that they end up having to figure out how they're going to feed uh, at least 5,000 people, only counting the men, not counting the women and children. And they end up doing it through a miraculous move of God. And so what you have next to each other is this moment of deep sorrow and this moment of seeing the miraculous working of God in a way that uh, they had not seen up to that point. And then Jesus says, hey, I'll take care of wrapping up. You guys go on ahead. And so they jump in the boat and all of a sudden the wind and the waves begin to work against them. And so in the middle of that, they're trying to figure out how they're going to make their way through. And Jesus says, well, I'll just catch up with you guys. I'll take a shortcut. And he comes walking on the water and they're like, it's a ghost. And they're terrified. And you know what? I'm with them. Like, Jesus, you can't be doing things that like breaks up metaphysics and you're like walking on water. Like, we didn't know you could do that. And so in that moment, sitting in the boat, freaked out by the storm, freaked out by superpower Jesus walking on water that we didn't know he could do that. Peter says, okay, you're doing something that's beyond me. But if it's you, call out to me and I'll, and I'll come to you. Like, I don't want to miss the courage that it takes to trust Jesus in that way. Like, I don't want to miss the courage that it takes to say, none of this makes sense to me. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I don't know how you're doing that. But if you say, come, I'm jumping in. I don't want to miss that out of 12 people in the boat, only one spoke up. I don't want to miss that Peter, who we often make fun of for being impetuous and got to jump it in too early, that all of a sudden in this moment, he said, Jesus, you're doing something that goes beyond what I understand. You're operating in the supernatural, not in the ordinary, but if you call me out, I'll, I'll walk with you in this. Uh, one of the things that you need to understand is that when we read this, we think this is a bad day out in the marina. But when, when somebody from that day and age read and thought about water, what they thought about was brokenness, and judgment. 
And so when you read through the scriptures and any time you see water, it's this picture of this, this, this moment of being judged. It's this moment of the Lord's wrath. And so you can go all the way back to the first page of your Bible, Genesis 1-1, when it says that the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. It's a picture of the chaos that was below, the disorder that was below the order that the Lord is about to bring. Or when you read some of your favorite narratives, and so uh, if you are a Charlton Heston person or maybe you're a Prince of Egypt person, uh, there's this moment when the Lord is delivering his people and they begin to walk through the Red Sea and dry ground. He moving in supernatural ways to make a way for them. And then when Egypt tries to come after them, he closes the waters to judge them. Uh, when you talk to your kids about Noah taking animals into the ark two by two, it's not just this picture of a floating zoo. It's the judgment of God against the world through water. And so over and over again, there's this picture of water signifying the chaos of the world, signifying the judgment against that chaos and the brokenness of the world. And so for them to say, okay, we'll get, I'll get into the chaos with you, Jesus, is a really profound statement. In fact, theologians who are smarter than me would talk about baptism as this picture of, of salvation through judgment, passing through the waters of judgment and coming on the other side with Jesus into new life. And Peter's saying, if you have power and command over this water and these winds and this wave, I'll, I'll walk with you in that. And I want to apply it to our hearts when it comes to baptism but I also think there's a bigger conversation here for just where we've been. Maybe it hadn't been winds and waves, but for the last two years, we've been dealing with some chaos. For the last two years, we've been sitting in this place trying to figure out which way was up. Like, like think about, think about being on the edge of a boat and seeing these waves and saying, I'm gonna put my full body weight on this. Talk about stepping into something that feels unstable, feels like it can't hold you, feels like it's not meant to be, that's not where you're meant to be. And it feels like, man, it's hard to find solid ground. And maybe I'm describing this text, but maybe I'm also describing your life over the last couple of years. Maybe you haven't known where to step or where to go or what to trust or where to lean into to put your weight on. And all of a sudden there's this Peter moment where you say, okay, Jesus, if you're calling me to step out and go forward, I'll trust you. And so Jesus says to Peter, come. And Peter, with all the courage he can muster, steps out. And I don't know how many steps he gets on the water, but the way that we read the text, it seems that he's making headway. He's moving forward. He's on the stroll. Like there are two people in human history that we know of that have walked on water, Jesus and Peter. And then all of a sudden the wind and the waves grab his attention and he takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink. Like, I don't, I don't want to dismiss that. I don't want to dismiss that, that sometimes it's a level of courage just to get out of the boat. But then there's another level of courage that when things are worse out there than what you thought they were going to be. Because it's one thing to put your weight on unstable water, but it's another thing when you're standing on unstable water to have these waves that are beating against you and this wind that's coming against you. And all of a sudden it's like, it would have been much safer if I've never done this at all. And you start thinking thoughts about how do I get back? And then all of a sudden you lose focus on the one that called you out there in the first place. And that's the interesting thing about this last couple of years, because if I can rewind back, the first three weeks of coronavirus, it felt like everybody wanted to help everybody and everybody tried to change the world and get on hotlines. Like we were in it. And then when it got worse than what we thought it was going to be, all of a sudden it was a little harder to see Jesus. All of a sudden it felt like we were sinking. All of a sudden it felt like we were overwhelmed. All of a sudden, like you couldn't have possibly called us into this, could you have? And then Peter does maybe the best thing that anybody can do when they're in that situation. He didn't try to fake it till he makes it. He didn't start working on his backstroke. He didn't try to prove himself with his doggy paddle. He literally says, I'm sinking, Lord, save me. Here's what sinking, when you're sinking and you cry out, Lord, save me, says, that you're close enough to get to me in the middle of this chaos. That you know exactly where I am, that you're not sitting there saying, well, Peter, if you'd been a better swimmer than that, you wouldn't be in this trouble. But that you love me enough that even in my failing that you'd come and rescue me. 
Can I, can I say to the person that maybe you're here and you're wrestling with follow, following Jesus because it feels like that there's no way that I can put my weight on, on trusting something that I don't know, that I haven't seen, that even in the, I'll just tell you in the days forward, that there are going to be hard days to come. That getting into baptism waters and coming out of those baptism waters, you're not going to magically all of a sudden be completely holy and completely without sin, and you're just going to do everything right from here on out. You get a halo, and you just got to make sure that it's shined every morning when you wake up. Like, that's not the Christian life. There is struggle and trial and suffering, and, and I don't want to pretend that all of that struggling and trial and suffering is from without, because some of it is self-inflicted from within. And the reality is, in the middle of your chaos, that he's as close as the whisper of his name. That in the middle of your chaos, when you feel like you are overwhelmed and drowning, and like, you know what, it would have been easier to go back to where I was before instead of stepping into what you called me into, Jesus. These waters are way too turbulent. I, I think I need to go back to the boat. That instead, if you cry out, Lord, save me, what you find is his hand reaching in your direction. And so Jesus reaches out and grabs Peter and pulls him into the boat. And he says, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And that's a rebuke, but it's also an invitation. It's also an invitation of Jesus to say, you can believe me more than what you do right now. And I don't, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. I, I mean it, have you ever been in a situation where somebody has offered you something? Um, I have... I have people in my life who are just immensely hospitable. And when I go and sit at that dinner table and they're like, you know, you can get more than that, right? And there's always this kind of like psychological jostling, right? Like, like do you really mean that? Or are you gonna judge me if I come back with a second plate? Cause this is really good, but I don't want you thinking thoughts about me. Like every time I might invite Mike over, I have to buy groceries cause he eats all my food. And so you like, don't get the second plate. And then they come back and say it again. Hey, you, you can get a second plate. And you're like, no, no, I'm okay. And so then they send you home with like three extra plates. Like you could believe me more than that. Like I'm gonna provide for you what I said I'm gonna provide. And in this moment, he's like, hey, Peter, oh, you of, of little faith, why did you doubt me? Like, why would you think that I would call you out here and not sustain you when I got you here? You can believe me more than that. Oh, Peter, why would you think that I have the, the power over these winds and waves, and, but all of a sudden when, you, when you're thinking that I couldn't sustain you when the winds and waves start, getting, start hitting you? Do you not know who I am? Do you not know that I'm the one that stepped out on nowhere, grabbed nothing, flung it across nowhere, told it to stay there, and that it did? Like, I've got power over it all. And so if, if that's the reality, you can trust me more than this. And I just want to encourage you whether you're on the, the, the precipice of getting out of the boat to trust Jesus and step into something that you don't necessarily know how to walk on, or whether you're in the middle of the water flailing, feeling like it's up around your ears and you're about to drown, you can trust him more than what you trust him now. And that's not to say that you're even being unfaithful, but there's more faithfulness to him than within the trust that you have. He will never run out of faithfulness even when you feel like you're at the end of your trust. And then I love the last two verses, or the last three verses ultimately together. It says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took, took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly you are the son of God. And what I don't want to miss is how close the proximity of doubt and worship is. Like, Jesus wasn't like, hey, when all of you get it together and believe, then I'll stop the winds and the waves. When all of you can figure your stuff out and like not be struggling a little bit with how you follow me, then I'm gonna do some things. In the middle of them doubting and worshiping, there's this revelation of you are truly the son of God. My hope for us is that we would see this picture of Jesus being truly the son of God in a way that gives us the trust to follow him wherever he may lead. Amen. That there would be nothing that would hold us back from saying, okay, Lord, if, if you're leading me into places that seem far beyond my capability, 
far beyond the, the ordinary small uh, strength that I have. That if you're leading me towards something, I trust you enough because you are who you say you are. That you are the son of God that has become man and come near to us. That you've closed the gap between our inability to get to God and, and God's deciding not to crush us by getting too near to us. That you've come near to us in such a way that I can trust that wherever you're leading is good. And so I want to invite you because this is, this is the, the fruit of the gospel. That to know that God would send his son to live perfectly and receive the penalty of our sin, not just so we can have clean records, but now we can have relationship and trust. Like, you, you know the difference, right? Like, you could have a zero relationship with somebody and have, have a clean record. And so some of you are those people, right? Like you've been driving for multiple years and you've never gotten a ticket and we're all jealous of you and that's why you always have to drive to lunch at, after church. You may have a clean record, but you don't have a relationship with an officer. I mean, maybe you do, but not because of your clean record. Like he's not inviting you over and saying, okay, you're, you're part of the family now because you never got a ticket. And so you can not be guilty of a crime or you can not be guilty of an infraction and still not have a relationship with the one who has power. But Jesus is inviting them in that by seeing him as the son of God, that what we get is union with Christ, that we get what the son gets, that we get the relationship that he gets, that we get the benefits that he gets, that we get the grace that he gets, that when we stand someday in front of God, he's not gonna be like, Mike, Johnny, six foot tall, male pattern baldness, you ain't getting in. What he sees is what the son has done on my behalf. And so to see him as truly the son of God is to see him as saying, well, I have access to God because of the way, the access that's been made through the son. And therefore I can sit and worship even in the middle of my doubts because the son has invited me in. And so I want to, I want to invite you in. I don't know how troubled the waters are around you. Maybe they're troubled because life is chaotic. Maybe they're troubled because you feel like you've been in this boat in the middle of chaos for the last two years and it's been really hard to find Jesus. Or maybe the waters are chaotic because of your sin. Uh, if you're new, uh, maybe you're here because uh, somebody that you love was getting, is getting baptized or somebody that you love uh, was dedicating a child. Um, we just, uh, we'll just be straight with you. Like we, we, we don't go light on sin. Like sin isn't this like kind of personality quirk or this thing that you got to work out. Sin is this apex predator that wants to destroy you. And, and ultimately that's why death is in the world is because of sin. But it's, it's, it's kind of this, this slow burn. It, it starts by just making you promises that it won't keep. It, it starts by just offering you um, this, this picture of the good life that it cannot fulfill. And then instead of giving you the, the fulfillment that you thought you were gonna get, what it ends up giving you is feeling let, worse off than where you started. And so desiring to do something more, something stronger, or something more powerful to get you to the thing that it didn't fulfill the last time. And then it leaves you with this remorse not this godly sorrow that produces life and repentance, but this remorse that leaves you laying saying, I, I, I don't want to be seen because of the shame that I feel for what I've done. And so when, when we talk about sin and sin causing chaos in your life, uh, we're not just trying to make the metaphor work because of water. This is what sin does. It destroys, it distorts, it disturbs. And Jesus in the middle of that, when you say, when you call out his name, will reach out and save you and say, I'm better than what you thought I was. Amen. So my prayer today, if you are here and you don't know Jesus, is that he would say, it looks crazy out there. But if it's you, Jesus, call me out and I'll come. That if it's you, Jesus, and you're calling me to step out and trust you, uh, nothing looks different. There's nothing tangible. The scriptures would say that faith is the evidence of the things that you don't see. And so this, this 
putting your trust and resting it upon Jesus, the opportunity to step out and do that, it comes in a moment when it says, if, it, if it's you, I'll come. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that for some of you, it's not this last 25 minutes of me yelling at you. He's been whispering your, whispering your name for a while. It's the grandmother that sends you a, a, a card with money in it, but she's always got to write a Bible verse at the bottom. It's, the, it's the, the barista who always gets your name wrong, but then says, God bless you at the end of it. And you're like, why do I always get that person? It's the old Sunday school lesson that you've been trying to forget, but it keeps playing over and over in your head in the middle of the night because somebody in your family has been praying, Lord, would you, would you make sure that they don't forget what they know about you? He's been calling out to you for a while saying, come and know me. I'm better than what you know. And my heart for you is that you would step out and trust him today. And so I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I don't always do this, but the reason I do is because I want to shut out everybody else. It's significant to me that of 12 people in the boat, that Peter was the only one that had the courage, that there was this level of shutting out everybody else and saying, I'm, I'm lasered in on Jesus. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes, bow your head. And as you're here, if you feel like Jesus is calling out to you to trust him, I already told you that the waters are gonna, the waters will be turbulent. But if the Lord's calling to you, and you're saying, okay, Lord, if it's if it's you, I'll step out. I'd love for you to just slip up your hand so I can know who I'm praying for. So if that's you and you want to respond to Jesus, will you lift your hand so I can pray for you right now? Amen. 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 Thank you. Lord, I just see various hands going up around the room. Some may be raising their hand for the first time to say, okay, Lord, you're calling to me and I want to respond. This is me stepping out. This is the amount of faith that I got to, to, step, on the tur to step out of the turbulent waters. For others, maybe they've known you for a while, but they've recognized that in this season, the courage that they've had to follow after you has slowly leaked out as the wind and the waves of just the, the craziness of the last two years has caused them to take their eyes off you. So Lord, I thank you that you're calling to their names so clearly that they raised their hands in response and said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. Grant them the courage necessary. Even if nobody else moves, grant them the courage necessary. Even if the wind and the wave seem to get more fierce, grant them the courage necessary to believe that you are what you said you are. You are who you said you are and that you're better than what they believed. Help them to deeply trust you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Again, thanks for watching this message online. And here's our hope, that you didn't just hear the Word of God, but that it compels you to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what we mean by that. We're not just giving you information, but we believe that there's steps that you take afterwards to obey Jesus, to serve the world around you, to give sacrificially, and to go to others who haven't heard the message. And so one, we would love to know you, particularly if you're in the Southern California area. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello, you can send us a digital connect card and we would love to follow up with you, just get to know you better. But we also hope that you didn't just hear a message and then just stow it away somewhere, but it compels you to obey and follow the way of Jesus. Uh, we pray that you do that in community. That's the best way to live this out. You can live it out. We just don't believe you should live it out alone. Uh, on top of that, we, we believe that this is an opportunity to serve. And whether that's you serving uh, the church or the community around you, that those who follow Jesus reflect Jesus by the way that they serve. And then we would ask that you give. Giving is not something that is uh, just kind of a tradition in the church. It's evidence that you fully trust Jesus in every dimension of your life. And then finally, we're praying that you go. 
that you would share this with someone else, that if the Lord has impacted you by his word to see Jesus better and love him more deeply, that you'd invite others to do the same by either sharing this message with them or entering into community with them and sharing what the Lord has done. So we're excited to hear from you, to connect with you, and to hear about what the Lord's doing through his word and in your life.